Okay, now, where was evangelicalism during these last 200 years? Well, as we told you, evangelicalism was functioning pretty well in the mainline churches until about the time of the Civil War. And then evangelicalism began to lose influence. Harold O.J. Brown, who's professor of theology at Trinity Seminary, has as good an explanation for the collapse of evangelicalism as a driving force in American religion as anybody. You will find this in Brown's very big book called Heresies. That's the title. It's a good book. You ought to read it. What Brown points out is that in the last half of the 19th century, large segments of evangelical Christianity, that is Protestant evangelicalism, orthodoxy, lost sight of the role of education and scholarship and philosophy in the preparation of ministers. And as scholarship and philosophy and theology became less central, you find it replaced with a greater emphasis upon religious experience. Now, you can see this at play in the, in the revivalist tendencies of the last half of the 19th century. In the work of Finley, for example, and then the work of Moody. Let's not worry about the study of philosophy. Let's not waste time studying uh, systematic theology. Let's just learn the latest techniques of evangelism, or today we could add in parentheses, church growth. All right. Let's get these, let's get these techniques and these strategies. Let's get people to feeling religious and it worked for a while. The churches grew, large numbers of people got saved, but as the disinterest in academics increased, the ability, there were fewer and fewer evangelicals left in pivotal places to defend the faith against the onslaught of German liberalism. You bet your life it's still around. There's a PCA pastor, and I will not identify where his church is located. All right. <laughs> Have you heard this before? I oh, <laughs> I really don't want to identify this guy because he could create problems for me. But uh, he's on record as saying that uh, the Christian church doesn't need any more of this philosophy stuff or any more of this theology stuff. Let's just get souls saved and uh, get them on their way. Well, that's where, that's where we began to lose the game. We have, on point after point, we have continued to abdicate our intellectual responsibility. As you probably know from your study of church history, no single event probably did more harm to evangelicalism in America as far as its public perception goes, than the Scopes trial. And there was a case where a man who had no business representing evangelicalism on a matter of science uh, presumed to, to speak for all of us, and I'm talking about William Jennings Bryan here, he just didn't know what he was doing. He was fair game for Clarence Darrow. He was made to appear the idiot, and that probably more than anything else in, uh, in that period of time uh, convinced uh, Americans that uh, evangelicalism was passe. It was no longer, uh, it no longer had a message that was relevant to the time. Now, um, but that's where things began to collapse. Now, there were other things that were going on that were helping lead to the eventual collapse of evangelicalism. And one of those other things was the whole business that we have called the moder modernity, the post-enlightenment mindset. Prior to the 
um, the eventual triumph of the Enlightenment mindset, Christians of almost every sort held to a common worldview. I'm talking here about uh, mainline Protestants, uh, Protestants in the smaller denominations, and I'm talking about Catholics. All of us held to a common worldview which regarded the Trinity as true, which regarded the incarnation and the virgin birth as true, which recognized the truth of supernaturalism, which recognized that we have a revealed word of truth from God. But as modernity swept through the 19th century, that Catholic evangelical synthesis, that common acceptance of a common worldview began to collapse. And it collapsed, first of all, in mainline Protestantism. Catholics continued to maintain a relatively conservative worldview until after Vatican II, when all the Dickens broke loose. And even today, when Catholicism is rent by all kinds of liberal ideas, they are really liberal Protestant ideas that have simply become incorporated into Roman Catholic, uh, into the Roman Catholic uh, institution. And incidentally, it is these same liberal ideas that the Pope is so anxious to counteract. Um, whatever we think about um, the Pope's emphasis upon Mary and Mariolatry and whatever we think about his view and his understanding of salvation, uh, John Paul II is a man who knows heresy when he sees it. And I'm talking here about Unitarianism. I'm talking about um, a repudiation of the miraculous and so on. So we have uh, the capitulation of Western man to the mindset of the modern world, which includes rationalism, naturalism, and the belief in progress. Remember those three elements of the Enlightenment. That man's mind becomes the ultimate standard of what is true or false in religion, that naturalism and scientism become the byword so that we must accept the natural order as science describes it. We can no longer believe in the mir mir miraculous, and we must have unbounded confidence in the future of the human species. Other th so, we have the collapse of a supernatural Christian worldview. We have this, the, the slow uh, decline of orthodox academics and scholarship such that um, uh, by the time you get to the, to the 1920s, one of the few seminaries left in America that still has some serious conservative scholars is Princeton Seminary. But even they are outnumbered denominationally, and um, they're, deno they're outnumbered by the liberals on the, on the Princeton faculty. And finally, they, uh, they are forced to leave and found... Uh, uh, a new seminary, Westminster Seminary. What else began to go wrong? What else began to go wrong for evangelicalism? Well, they weren't, they didn't handle the evolution thing properly. You know, Darwinism came along. This, um, in 1859, Darwin began to publish his ideas. Um, those ideas became uh, uh, commonly accepted. Uh, uh, the evangelical response too often was one of ridicule, such as follows. Well, you may have monkeys in your family tree, but I don't have any monkeys in my family tree. Well, that's a powerful argument there. That'll really impress a lot of people. Um, um, it's interesting to read it's very interesting to read the unedited editions of the Fundamentals, which was the series of pamphlets that were published, uh, uh, oh, from 1910 and onward. Uh, some of the best Orthodox scholars in the world, including, uh, including outstanding scholars like James Orr from Scotland, 
they contributed articles to the fundamentals and in some of those and this is where you really have to if you're a fundamentalist today you gotta hang on to your chair some of those um, early articles in the fundamentals as early as 1910 to 1915 argued for a much more sophisticated approach towards the evolution challenge much more sophisticated it's none of this William Jennings Bryan stuff these guys were saying they were even offering out the possibility of theistic evolution they were even saying look even if all of this were true and maybe it isn't but even if all of this were true who's to say that this isn't the way that God chose to bring the human race into existence I don't advocate that view myself but I'm simply offering it as an example that there were some things going on in um, fundamentalism in the early 20th century that people don't know about then you have biblical criticism and which comes first um, the chicken or the egg um, did the collapse of an authoritative did did the collapse of confidence in the Bible open the door wide for biblical criticism or did uh, the onslaught of a destructive biblical criticism further undermine any confidence in an authoritative Bible it was probably a little bit of both uh, you can't you can't say that one of them was the dominant figure there what we can do today looking back over a, more than a century at the more destructive forms of biblical criticism that, that arose during the say 1880s and so on what we can see today is the is the role of presuppositions in that biblical criticism the fact that these liberals took methods took a methodology that could have been harmless that could have been enlightening and illuminating and they combined it with naturalistic presuppositions such that today even today it's not so much the method as it is the presuppositions that control the methodology this is a point that I argue in uh, my book Christian faith and historical understanding we don't have to be afraid even of methodologies like form criticism or redaction criticism we can learn things from those methods it was the presuppositions that those liberal form critics and those liberal redaction critics brought to their work that led to their destructive conclusions see we just didn't have people who were fighting the battles in the right way so by the time you get to the 1920s evangelicalism has lost any significant voice in practically every one of the mainline churches they've all gone south and they the liberals control the seminaries they control the colleges and what did evangelicals do well they began to um, to become exiles um, sometimes they just shut up until their year till they could start collecting their retirement and they were faithful in their own little congregations but they no longer exerted any influence in the in the um, in the general assembly or wherever but more often than not they simply isolated themselves into new conservative denominations which continued to multiply by splitting okay this is what happened with the Presbyterians J Gresham Machen led his crew away and he had to had I been a member of the uh, Northern Presbyterian Church uh, I'd have I'd have left Princeton with Machen I'd have joined Machen's denomination but then notice what happened that in no time at all Machen's group had split over eschatology of course Carl McIntyre would you know um, we're gonna have to keep our eyes on Carl McIntyre in heaven we really are because he's he's gonna try and split the Saints up there too I guarantee it but uh, you got Carl McIntyre with his um, radical separatism and his dispensationalism and his pre-tribulationism and out of that comes the Bible Presbyterian Church and then you get these Presbyterian groups that are splitting all over the place such that all of them are tiny um, largely impotent 
uh, uh, often weak on evangelism and uh, outside of the PCA have relatively little influence even today. Um, then in the case of the Baptists, you've got the Baptists leaving the Northern Baptist uh, Church and starting this fundamentalist group or this conservative group and fighting among themselves and continuing to dissipate their energies and their resources. But finally, after wandering in the wilderness through the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, finally after World War II, a small group of evangelicals began to get their act together. And that's what makes, that's what made the founding of Fuller Seminary such a symbol such a major symbol and it's the collapse of Fuller Seminary that makes the loss of that symbol so tragic and so painful for those of us who remember those days Fuller became a symbol that evangelicals were tired of being shunted off to the back back pew that we were we were announcing to the world that we were back and we were interested in serious scholarship and we weren't going to take any liberal crap anymore. We were out to do battle, all right? That's what Fuller stood for. And the target of Fuller Seminary from its, among its founding faculty were the errors of neo-orthodoxy. Here we are. And man, what a faculty they gathered together. It's unlikely that you'll ever see a crew like that again. Carl Henry and Edward Carnell and, and um, my goodness, all of those guys, some of whom then, of course, began to have very serious problems as the, as the decades rolled by. But then after Fuller, I suppose the next, major, the next major symbolic move was the founding of Trinity, Evangelical Divinity. Not the founding, because it had always been there as a small, unassuming, rather impotent, theological training institute for the evangelical free church but then uh, the people at Trinity saw the wisdom of inviting Kenneth Concer to move from Wheaton College to Trinity and Concer went there with a vision and the freedom to build the best faculty he could and uh, what a what a place that became for a while for a while huh Kenneth Concer um, uh, incidentally, since I'm writing Concer's name on the board, let me let me speak well of Concer here in the next five minutes before the break. Concer is not a name that you hear very often. He has not published. Uh, n he's published hardly anything. Most of his publications are little chapters in in collections, book collections. Um, but he was um, um, he's a graduate of Harvard, got his Ph.D. at Harvard, uh, went to Wheaton College where he was dean of the graduate school, a professor of theology uh, during the late 40s and through most of the 50s. Uh, he then was invited to become dean at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Um, one of One of the regrets of people like me is that a man like Concer wasn't, able to publish more than he did because whenever he did publish on a subject he um, he brought great clarity enormous wisdom to the subject and was always right on target during the late 70s Concer became editor of Christianity Today but by then uh, Christianity Today had become kind of a team effort in which the editor really no longer exercised the kind of uh, control that a Carl Henry or a Harold Lenzel had exercised during its first 15 or 20 years, so that Concer's contribution was really diminished to a great extent by the, uh, the flowchart, the administrative flowchart at CT, which got increasingly more complicated. But here's, here's, a, here's an often unheralded uh, but major player in the development of evangelical uh, Christianity. And uh, he's one of those guys that the rest of us, um, you know, we see farther because we're standing on his shoulders 
and the shoulders of other people like Carl Henry and Gordon Clark and so on. So, you know, by the time we get to 1976, evangelicalism is back. Its seminaries are healthy, they've got strong faculties, although some of them are in decline. Um, and the situation is such that Time Magazine in 1976 declares 1976 as the year of the evangelical. But what I, what I hope I'm making clear here, even though I'm covering large sweeps of time in great generalities, is that by the time evangelicalism had risen from the ashes, uh, American culture had become disinterested, had become so secularized that the evangelical message was now, uh, evangelicals were banging their heads up against a basically disinterested uh, nation. Um, so that during those decades when we could have helped shape and help transform American culture and help stop the bleeding, we were largely impotent. We were off in a corner somewhere doing nothing, fighting with ourselves, and um, we really lost the opportunity. Um, to the extent that people associate evangelicalism with um, uh, power in America, it, it comes largely through uh, some kind of resonance with America's civil religion. If 1976 was the apex of evangelical, well, the 1976-1980 period is often cited in textbooks as the apex of evangelical power because there is a myth abroad in the land that it was the moral majority and other evangelical political activists who helped elect uh, Reagan. And there is some uh, truth to that. Um, certainly the last decade has been a period of great decline and let's just try to identify some of the signs and causes of the evangelical decline in the last ten years. Certainly a lot of it has to do with the, the, the public face of evangelicalism on television. My goodness, <clears throat> you know, I'm thankful that we live in a free country where there can be religious television. But boy are we getting... <laughs> Are we getting, are we getting a bad, a raw deal from the people who are supposedly representing us, right? Why is, where are the responsible evangelicals? There's James Stanley, that's responsible stuff. There's Charles, Jim, Charles Stanley. Charles Stanley. <laughs> How soon we forget. How soon we forget. There's Charles Stanley, whatever his name is. Uh... There's responsible biblical preaching there. Uh, there's James Kennedy. And uh, is there anything else? Um, but you look at this marvelous opportunity, and the people who are filling this time are people who really are barely equipped to teach uh, first and second graders. That's the level of maturity and biblical knowledge and cultural awareness that many of them bring to their programs. Um, and then, of course, there was the whole collapse, the whole, the whole um, Jim Baker, Jimmy Swaggart set of scandals in the 1980s that uh, gave everybody a black eye and made all of the uninformed people in America think that um, every Christian evangelist is a charlatan and a sex pot and everything else. Uh, during the late 80s, after the Jimmy, uh, Jim Baker scandal, uh, I, was asked, I, was, I was asked to participate as a token. I don't think they knew what I was, but they were going to have a conference at North Texas State University on... Uh, uh, the threat that worldwide fundamentalism poses to um, free, freedom-loving societies. And they, yeah, 
and they included not only American fundamentalism, Christian fundamentalism, but Muslim fundamentalism, and they picked some other religions as well. And I, I remember sitting on the platform after the first two papers on Christian fundamentalism, after the first two guys had just made all of these snide uh, comments about Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart, and the audience was snorting and s laughing and haw-hawing, when in fact everybody in that audience had probably done far worse than any of these guys had ever dreamed of doing, which is not to minimize the peccadillos of Jimmy Swaggart or Jim Baker. And uh, so I, I got up and I said, I really don't know what you people are laughing about because you really, you know, if you were informed, and I did this in my usual winsome, friendly, smiling way, <laughs> if you were informed, you'd realize that these guys are hardly representative of American evangelicalism. You keep, you keep pointing out their sins and their failures and their acts of idiocy, but not a one of them is a true blue evangelical. You know, they're all off into some kind of other thing. Uh, they, they are theologically uninformed. Uh, they're not doctrinally sound. Uh, so if you want to know who the true evangelicals are, they're the people who are not doing these sorts of things, and you ought to read about them. And you ought to recognize that they're responsible people who believe in democracy, who believe in pluralism in a political sense, um, who are not out to turn America into a right-wing theocracy. Um, we believe in representative government, etc., and uh, I've never been invited back to speak at North Texas State either. So, um, and then, of course, there is the whole theological collapse of the evangelical movement. As seminary after seminary and college after college begins to play around with this heresy or that heresy, and um, apparently um, uh, is they are just rapidly losing their commitment to what evangelical Christians are supposed to stand for. So it really, it really raises fear and doubt in the mind of informed people as to where the evangelical movement is going to be in 20 years. Certainly, uh, I think, our young people will have to get their education at schools that we don't customarily think of these days because if present conditions continue, those schools will be lost to evangelicalism. As earlier evangelical colleges uh, turned left. So uh, anyway, things don't look good. Uh, there probably is good cause to talk about uh, Western civilization, Christian civilization being in a period of real crisis and maybe there is some point to continued talk about um, the, the, the modernity, post-modernity crisis. Um, uh, old, old rifles used to have a lock spring, and uh, they would always snap back. And it occurred to him that there must be something like that present in human nature, a kind of lock spring that, if allowed to go unchecked, will always snap us back in the wrong direction. Always. Towards unbelief. And towards liberalism. And uh, the more I... And he's to, he told me that about ten years ago. His name is Bob Mouth, New Testament scholar, uh, former colleague of mine. I think Bob is right. That we need always to be on our guard. And thus... No institution is safe uh, unless the trustees are doing their job and the administrators are doing their Every time it comes time for a new president to be appointed somewhere, you better start praying because you're just, you're just 30 minutes away from disaster because if the wrong guy gets appointed as a president, uh, forget it. Uh, somebody said to me, I was out in California a couple of weeks ago, why is it that these schools are drifting? And I said, many of them, many of them are, uh, well, every one of them is drifting because they have a president who isn't doing his job. And he isn't doing his job either because he is A, a wimp. Okay? God deliver us from theological wimps.
and they often become presidents because you see you climb the ladder and you 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 become popular and so on either they're wimps it doesn't get any better <laughs> or b they're stupid all right they're ignorant they don't recognize heresy when they see it they don't they lack the ability to see the logical implications of where a professor's ideas are going or else they're just politicians they're playing the game trying to hold out until they become 65 and they can qualify for retirement and let the next guy clean up the place I don't know but um, uh, to just take one more minute this chapter which is taken out of my book The Closing of the American Heart argues that uh, for one other step in this recovery of truth and one other step in the development of an answer to uh, the present crisis we've got to recover a proper understanding of the role of truth in religion of revealed truth in religion of supernatural truth in religion and this is what this is what the post-enlightenment world did. It eliminated knowledge, information, and revealed truth. It took it away from the church, and that helped produce the secular world that has come to this point of crisis right now.